What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about a total shoulder arthroplasty. So basically a total shoulder replacement. So like any other joint in the body, it can be replaced. So you can't have a prosthesis inserted into the um, bone and create a joint replacement. So this can also happen in your thumb. So fun fact, if it's a joint, it can be replaced. Uh, so a big thing about anatomy that we'll need to understand is just how the whole um, joint works itself. So again, we have our humerus and then it'll have a humeral head. Now, again, this has been replaced here. And then normally the scapula has the glenoid uh, cavity with the glenoid labrum on top. Again, the cavity is scraped down and the labrum is taken out and replaced with a prosthetic piece. So that's in a normal total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, there's such thing as a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, which actually is becoming more common because it offers an extra level of stability. So if you're a patient who maybe they had a bunch of shoulder dislocations, um, they have RA or they have just severe deterioration of the joint and they're needing a lot more stability, they'll end up electing for a reverse total shoulder. So instead of the um, glenoid being concave, it becomes convex. And instead of the, con the convex uh, head of the humerus, it now becomes a concave little button thingy. Um, so again, it's just a different way that they like to do it. Um, this one is going to give up range of motion to gain stability. Um, this one's going to give up stability to gain range of motion. So again, usually up to the surgeon to decide which one. The protocols are pretty much very similar. Just understand if somebody has a reverse total shoulder, you're not going to get them as much range of motion as if they had a regular one. Um, and I've seen this firsthand. Like I got this person all the way to the end range and it just was like, that's all we're going to get. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally fine. So just a piece of information to keep in mind clinically. Uh, but for the sake of this video, we will be talking basically about the regular total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, so again, making sure to remember what muscles are around the shoulder. So again, our muscles of our rotator cuff. So SITS is our acronym. And then again, we have our muscles that are going to be surrounding the um the shoulder, which is going to be like our deltoids, our biceps, triceps, all of those muscles that kind of attach in and around the shoulder. Those are going to have to be kind of finagled and re-anchored in different places sometimes when you have a total shoulder arthroplasty, especially if there's a lot going on. So when we come to strengthening, those are going to be the muscles that we kind of prioritize, especially the rotator cuff muscles. So how does this happen? I like this image because all the, these Google images are great. So we have a ton of arthritis forming here on the head of the um, humerus. And so what's happening is it's getting onto that synovial lining and it's grinding in. So just like how in the knee or in the hip, you have osteoarthritis. So that's the primary cause of why somebody would need to get a uh, total shoulder arthroplasty that they have osteoarthritis. Same reason why somebody would need a knee replacement. Same reason why somebody would need a um, hip replacement. It's grinding down, it's bone on bone, according to the people. Um, and so because of that, it's painful and it's limiting their range of motion. So again, usually this is happening with individuals who are over 55. So that primary age to be developing osteoarthritis in many joints, uh, shoulder is not uh, going to be... Uh, spared in that as well. So again, it can also happen due to some traumatic onset. So again, some of these could be uh, like a fracture, rotator cuff tear, dislocation, like a really bad one where it's like, like almost like it's chewbacca out of there, like ripped out of the shoulder. <laughs> like you'll definitely need a replacement if that happens because they got to reattach and re-anchor everything and they're just like we're just going to replace it at this point. Um, again, cancer can happen at the end, the distal aspect of many of the long bones in the body. Again, most likely osteosarcomas are happening in the distal femur, proximal tibia, but the shoulder at the proximal shoulder joint is no exception. So sometimes, you know, tumors can arise there. So that's why they would need to basically slice it off and uh, put something else in there instead. So basically the prosthetic. Um, so these are some of the reasons why a patient could end up with this. And the big thing to understand is that if it's a traumatic onset or like avascular necrosis, so remember that's if the uh, humeral head dies, um, due to a lack of blood flow to the humeral head. So this can happen in any joint, most likely happens in like the hips, um, but it can happen here. It can happen in the jaw. It can happen in a lot of different joints. If it's a joint, it can happen. That's basically the big thing that's going on. If it's a joint, it can happen. Um, so that could result in a younger patient needing a total shoulder uh, arthroplasty. And it could be as young as in their thirties, kind of crazy. 
But that's kind of the etiology of why somebody would need that. Now, again, what does it look like? So I like this picture, even though this person has lymphedema, a lot of people have been suggesting to do total shoulder arthroplasties on people with lymphedema due to the increased stress on the joint to stabilize it. Look, this person got a lot of anchors going on. This is a reverse total shoulder for this patient here. But again, regardless of which type of shoulder replacement the patient gets, they have this long scar here. And so if you're listening to this um, on a podcast, I have the, video, the picture on YouTube, but they have this long scar here. And so the scar is going to be, we have to make sure we're taking care of the scar. That's a big thing. Um, so it's going to be different than a rotator cuff repair because that's like three little little tiny incisions. This is usually one long one, kind of how a knee is one long one, but then an ACL repair is like a couple little ones. So again, big open um, surgery that they're doing. And so you'll see all the typical signs of osteoarthritis on the um, uh, x-ray. So this person got really bad osteoarthritis. Uh, and so that's what the patient will see. And then after they have the surgery on the x-ray, you would see the prosthetic in there. And then also you would see uh, this big scar. So again, you'll see all the typical signs that you would see after any joint replacement. So decreased range of motion, usually the patient's under precautions for this one. Um, so here's the thing about the boards. The boards recognizes that many surgeons have different ideas of how they want to talk about their precautions for the patient, but there's a lot of things that kind of overlap. So they've kind of split everything up into the acute phase, the subacute and the chronic phase. They've kind of made that a blanket statement for when it's appropriate to put interventions. And that's just because if you don't have a protocol or like, I don't know, your surgeon like just doesn't have one or that you don't, the patient doesn't know who did their surgery or something crazy like that, or it was a while ago, or I don't know, things can happen. You have to be able to know, like, is this really appropriate to be putting in at this time or not? Um, so that's why there's not going to be a specific protocol to follow for the exam because everybody's different. But because of this, you're going to see all the same symptoms, the pain for the patient, like the difficulty sleeping, the complaints of like difficulty, like pain with movement. You'll see the swelling, the edema, because yes, the person just got sliced and diced. So again, they're going to swell up. Uh, the decreased strength due to having to reattach muscles um, or cut through muscles and then difficulty with ADLs. So a lot of patients are like, I can't wipe my ass. That's literally going to be what they say. And you know what? That's a functional activity that we can work towards with this patient, but within their precautions, because usually internal and external rotation are going to be limited in the acute phase for this patient. So that's just one thing we'll have to keep in mind. So we're seeing pretty much the same similar things we would see after any joint replacement, but it's just in the shoulder. So how are we treating it? So again, we usually like in the clinic, in a clinical setting, you have a protocol, you're just following that protocol so you don't piss the surgeon off. And then everyone's happy, the patient gets better, the surgeon keeps sending you patients, we're all happy. Um, but here are some general guidelines for how you would do acute chronic subacute phase. So the acute phase is like that initial stage of healing, usually lasts a couple of weeks after the patient um, undergoes surgery. So again, um, patient, like I would say usually like eight weeks is going to be when it starts switching over, especially for a shoulder replacement. Um, but in that phase, you're working mostly, mostly on that PROM, decreased pain and swelling. Uh, so like those easier exercises, the the therapist is doing, you know, gentle range of motion with the patient. Um, towards the tail end, you start moving into that active assisted sort of stuff. Um, but again, like for this patient right now, you're mainly focusing on passive range of motion and a little bit of um, active assisted uh, range of motion with this patient as well. Uh, basically, the big thing is just decreasing their pain and making them a little bit more comfortable. So they keep coming back to therapy so then they get better. Um, so subacute phase is going to be working on active range of motion, increasing the strength of the patient. So once they've gotten out of that like really acute phase of healing, we're moving more into an active range of motion and increasing strength. So beginning with, you know, just regular range of motion, and then maybe you're adding weights as we move along. But again, that stuff is not happening in that fresh kind of stage. And then the chronic stage is where you're focusing, like you got the strength back, you got the range of motion back. Now we're working on those ADL skills and stuff. So this is where we work on the patient being able to wipe their ass. And that is the best example I can think of because you will have a patient that says that, and it will be a goal we can work towards 100%. That is a functional activity. Big th other things are like reaching above their head to grab in cabinets, you know, walking their dog, like doing a bunch of like driving is a big one to be able to do that internal external rotation coming over. Uh, those are some big functional activities. So, you know, increasing any uh, range of motion and increasing any strength and helping, you know, rebuild those neuromuscular um, 
activation systems as they get back and to be able to do what they want to do. So I have patients that needed to return back to work. So we had to work on like lifting and moving things around and like driving their forklift and stuff like that. And that's what you got to do. So in the chronic stage, like everything's like we've, we've accomplished the healing process. Now we're just trying to get back to, you know, all the goals and things that they wanted to do previously. Now that all the craziness post-surgery has calmed down. So again, we're educating the patient on that scar management. Cause again, in this last picture, that's a pretty nasty scar. It's a pretty big one. So, you know, don't jump in a pool until everything's like, you know, closed up. Um, once it's closed up, you can put like cocoa butter or anything with like vitamin E in it on it to help with the scar management. Um, doing a soft tissue massage on the scar, like a cross friction massage can also help with the patient um, once that scar has been healed and just educating um, the patient on proper wound management to make sure it doesn't get infected. Because remember, big thing, boards is a safety test. They don't want things getting infected. Getting infected means a patient gets a systemic infection and dies. We don't want that. So educating the patient on that. Um, and then again, modalities to decrease pain can be applied at pretty much any stage. Um, they're going to suggest that. And then avoiding weight bearing for a bit. And this is also true if a patient has an elbow replacement. So again, that's also kind of rare. But um, yeah, with a shoulder, elbow, wrist, finger replacement, like you're avoiding weight bearing for a little bit. Um, so no like push-ups or like, you know, pushing up from a chair is going to be contraindicated for a little bit. Um, so those are the big things to just think of with this patient. They might not be able to use that arm to help them with getting up from a chair for functional activities. And remember, this is an older patient, so that might be an issue for them. Um, and then a big thing is the patient will not regain full range of motion usually, especially with that reverse total shoulder. They're more going to regain it within functional limits. And then again, where we're avoiding internal external rotation during that acute phase, usually like it's it's only like a little bit that you can move. Like when, if you're doing passive range of motion, it's just like the tiniest little bit, just making sure it's going to be able to move those ways, but like you're not stretching into it at all. Um, so that's going to be a big thing for the patient to avoid doing. So what are our keywords? Again, osteoarthritis is the etiology. You'll do a normal total shoulder replacement. Rheumatoid arthritis, you'll do the reverse. I say you, <laughs> we're not cutting people. <laughs> That's when the surgeon will do the reverse total shoulder. Um, range of motion, and then you gain range of motion back first, and then you gain the strength. Um, again, it's going to probably be an older adult that you'll be treating for this. And so big thing is just maximizing the patient's function as much as you can, getting them back to doing all the things they wanted to do. Because the reason why they got a replacement, probably because they got to the point where they're like, my arm hurts so much, I can't pick up my grandkid. So like the, they got to a point where they couldn't do stuff. So now we, as they get into that chronic phase, we get them back to doing that. And then protocol is just going to be follow the protocol of whatever the surgeon says. Again, the boards won't have a protocol, but just keep that, put that in your clinical box that there will be a protocol to follow. So here's our sample question. A patient underwent a total shoulder arthroplasty four weeks ago. Which of the following exercises would not be appropriate for this patient during this phase? One, overhead reaching with a three pound weight. Two, active assisted range of motion on a sliding board on the table. Three, range of motion exercises performed by therapists or four pendulums. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is going to be that overhead reaching with the three pound weight. So big thing to think about is that this is going to be contraindicated in that four weeks out. In this phase, we are most likely in that subacute phase or not subacute. Sorry, we're in the acute phase. Strengthening does not start until the subacute phase. So again, this patient being only four weeks out, that's still pretty fresh. Usually around eight weeks is when the magical changeover happens. The boards will be nice and tell you the patients in the acute phase or subacute phase. Um, generally, if they're less than six weeks out from like any surgery, especially a shoulder surgery, they're going to be in the acute phase. Like it's very, very safe to assume that just based off of like it's fresh. Like they had surgery less than a month ago. Even your knee replacements that are killing it, they still got all the swelling. They still got all this edema. Um, they still have a significant amount of pain and decreased range of motion. Like four weeks is definitely going to be acute for pretty much any patient under the sun. Um, so that's a safe assumption to be making. Now, as we get later on, it starts getting a little interesting. So safe to assume that anything less than a month on the boards is still going to be in the acute phase. Um, so that active assisted range of motion appropriate during the acute phase, 
manual range of motion performed by the therapist. That's passive range of motion, stretching, flexibility. That's fine. Pendulum's always the first go-to when you're treating a patient with any sort of shoulder pathology that recently had surgery. So very safe for um, acute phase. All right, friends. So I hope that this was helpful in explaining total shoulder arthroplasties. I know it gets a little confusing with the different surgeries and protocols and whatnot, but I hope that this helped clarify some things. And now you'll be able to answer a question right on the exam. So take care and I'll see y'all later.